Right, well, uh, that song I thought was appropriate uh, for this weekend as we're considering Memorial Day weekend in uh, our country, and um, uh, that's straight from the Psalms. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And um, uh, when you consider um, what our nation is, what it has been, um, what is becoming, it's a nation that needs a lot of prayer right now. And um, we, uh, I really believe that a nation that chooses to honor the Lord is a nation that is blessed. And um, not necessarily financial prosperity, that might be part of it, but it is a nation that God chooses to bless. And um, uh, you see that throughout Scripture, and you see that when his people turn from him, the results of that uh, were drastic, and they were always negative, and then they turned back to him, and he blessed them. And so uh, uh, we need to be in prayer for our nation and our leaders and uh, those that are in authority, um, a nation that honors the Lord is a nation that is blessed. And uh, tomorrow is Memorial Day, and uh, it's a time where we remember those that have paid the ultimate sacrifice uh, for the freedoms that we have in this country. And um, um, the rights that we have in this country, I believe, are God-given. They are rights that we have simply for existing, uh, that all humans have uh, but the freedoms that we have to exercise those rights are um, what these people have paid the ultimate sacrifice for. And we honor them and remember them tomorrow on that day. And uh, so I thought it would be appropriate to um, um, talk about being a good soldier of the Lord as we are considering soldiers and, and the sacrifice that they have paid uh, for our freedoms. And so if you have your Bibles, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. That's where we're going to be this morning. And uh, while you're turning there, um, I was reading some things the other day about um, directions on various appliances and various things uh, that uh, I found kind of comical. And um, as we're considering what it means to remember and remember the sacrifice that uh, those that have paid the ultimate a price and remembering Jesus Christ and serving him as a good soldier of the Lord, sometimes we need to remember the directions that are given to us in life and the directions uh, that, of things that we use on a daily basis, right? And there are things that we often forget. Sometimes you forget to turn on your blinker on your car, right? Sometimes you forget to turn it off. Have you ever driven a long way without turning your blinker off? That's kind of embarrassing. Uh, I found some things the other day. These are real directions on various things that, um, uh, for whatever reason, I'm assuming people forget to do this, but uh, you'll, you'll find these kind of funny. On a Sears hair dryer, do not use while sleeping. Okay? On a bag of Fritos, you could be a winner, no purchase necessary. Details inside. On a bar of dial soap, directions, use like regular soap. On packaging for an iron, do not iron clothes on body. These are real directions. And so somebody, the scary part is that somebody probably did these things for them to put them on there. Uh, on most brands of Christmas lights, for indoor or outdoor use only. On a bag of peanuts, warning, contains nuts. <laughs> On a child Superman costume, wearing of this garment does not enable you to fly. <laughs> These are real, okay? Um, On a Swedish chainsaw, do not attempt to stop chain with hands or genitals. Emergency safety procedures at a U.S. summer camp. In case of food, or in case of flood, excuse me, proceed uphill. In case of flash flood, proceed uphill quickly. <laughs> On a Harry Potter wizard's broom, this broom does not actually fly. On a muffin packet, remove wrapper, open mouth, open mouth, insert muffin, eat. Be, be sure to follow that very carefully. Rules on a tram in Prague. Beware. To touch these wires is instant death. Anyone found doing so will be pro uh, prosecuted. <laughs> on a toilet cleaning brush. Do not use orally. On a bottle of hair dye. 
do not use as ice cream topping. Here's one. On a mattress, do not attempt to swallow. You know, it's, it's crucial that we remember these things. And like I said, the scary part is that these wouldn't be on there unless somebody had done that. Uh, but sometimes we forget uh, to do things, right? Very simple things sometimes. And it's crucial that we remember things and remember what God has told us to do in his word, to honor him and to be a good soldier of Christ. And as we are considering this weekend what it means to remember and remember those that have paid the ultimate sacrifice, I want us to remember um, Jesus Christ who has paid the ultimate sacrifice on our behalf and who gives us freedom and righteousness in him. And Paul... Uh, The Apostle Paul, in this chapter we're going to look at here, describes believers as soldiers of Jesus Christ. And it's a very vivid vivid image to compare followers of Christ to, because we often think of soldiers as fighters, right? And that's certainly one function of a soldier. By the way, we have Cody back with us, so where's Cody? There he is. Yeah, so uh, good to see you, Cody. Um, That's certainly one function of a soldier, but in Paul's letter to young Timothy, he finds himself imprisoned under Nero's reign. If you know anything about Nero, he was a very um, harsh dictator known uh, known for uh, persecuting Christians. And um, unlike his uh, former confidence in Paul's letters of being released, he doesn't present this hope in this letter. He uh, uh, is pretty certain that he will face death in this imprisonment. Uh, And he does, eventually, he was martyred for his faith in Christ. And in writing this letter to Timothy, he seems a little bit concerned that Timothy was in danger of of weakening spiritually. And this was a grave concern for him because he uh, felt that he was entrusting his ministry uh, to Timothy. We all have people in our lives that have been mentors and people that uh, have entrusted something with us, almost as if we're carrying on their legacy. Paul was Timothy's mentor. And Paul was helping Timothy, so he found it necessary to encourage him and to spur him on in his faith. And we see that in 2 Timothy 1.6 where he says um, um, it's the hard working, or uh, he says to spur, be spurred on in your faith. Uh, 2 Timothy 1.6, uh, he says to fan into flame the gift that is in you. And he's encouraging Timothy, and so Paul found, finds it necessary for him to continue his legacy that he is leaving Um, to Timothy, uh, leaving to him. And so he encourages him and and refers to him as a soldier of Jesus Christ, uh, saying, you are fighting the good fight. You are running the race. And we often don't like to think of the Christian life as something that is difficult, right? But it is. We don't like to think of it as something that we toil through, that we fight through. But it is one of those things that if we live in a godly manner, it's going to be difficult. I remember my dad used to, when I played baseball growing up, my dad used to get me out in the yard and just work with me on pitching for a long time. And some days it felt like my arm was going to fall off. And uh, I did discover a secret. Uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, guys would use muscle magic or um, Icy Hot to I, uh, help their arm feel better. And I found out that arthritis capsation did a far better job than anything. And so I just started using that in high school. And uh, uh, the, the people at the pharmacy didn't know why I was buying arthritis capsation, but it really worked very well. And so, uh, but my dad had me out throwing many pitches. My arm felt like it was going to fall off, but when it came game time, it always paid off. I could always tell when I wasn't working hard the week before because I wouldn't pitch as well. And uh, it always paid off when I was working hard. And even though the struggle but prior to that was difficult, it paid off. And so the Christian life is one that we... Uh, we toil through, we fight through. And this is an aspect of our faith that we don't like to think about, but it is uh, very difficult sometimes. And Paul is encouraging Timothy here as a soldier of the Lord. And we're called to live as worthy soldiers of Christ, as good soldiers of the Lord. So how do we do this? We know the commands of Scripture. We know what we're called to do. So how do we do it? What is the foundation that a soldier of the Lord has to be built upon? Paul gives this prescription in this passage. We're going to look at a few verses. So keep your Bibles open. We're going to stop a few times. Uh, But there are three imperatives I really want us to see here from this passage. So let's start in 2 Timothy chapter 2. And we're going to read through uh, verses 1 through 7. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus... And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men 
who will be able to teach others also. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. It is the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. So let's stop right there for a minute. The first thing about a good soldier we have to realize is that a good soldier suffers for his enlister. Paul writes this letter in the midst of suffering while he's in prison, so it's appropriate that he focuses a large portion of this passage on the suffering of a soldier of the Lord. The mark of a Christian is not prosperity, but it is suffering. That is when the acid test comes. That is when people will know that we are a child of God. It's easy to serve him when, we're, when we prosper, right? It's when we are tested, when we go through a trial, that it's difficult. That's contrary to the message that many churches are preaching today. Many churches say, become a Christian and get rich. And that's not what the Bible says. Paul says in verse 3, to share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ. And we're to follow Christ to the ultimate suffering, even death if necessary. In other words, if we're not willing to lay down our lives for his sake, we are not good soldiers. And we often associate being a good soldier of the Lord with being a witness for the Lord. And certainly that applies. The Greek word, did you know this? The Greek word for witness in, in the New Testament means martyr. That's what the early church understood about following Christ. It could mean they, they would lay down their very lives. It's not taken lightly. If, if that was what we understood following Christ to be in our culture today, how many people would still claim to be Christians? I think we'd have some empty pews here. The Greek word means martyr, to be a witness, to be a soldier for Christ. We might have a lot of empty, empty pews, but the acid test of whether or not we are a good soldier for the Lord is how we suffer, not how we prosper. I'm reading a book right now by uh, uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a German pastor uh, during World War II. It's called The Cost of Discipleship. And Dietrich bon Bonhoeffer eventually lost his life for following Christ. He was executed. Paul clarifies this. He continues, and he, he, he makes sure that our suffering is done for the sake of Christ. He says, no soldier gets entangled in civilian Pursuit, since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. If we suffer because of our own stupidity, which we've probably all been there before, right? Um, if we suffer because, of our, suffer because of our own stupidity, that's not being a good soldier. That's not what Paul is talking about. There's a godly way to deal with our, our mistakes, but that's not what Paul is talking about. Here he's talking about suffering on behalf of Christ. He says, don't get in, involved in civilian pursuits. In other words, Christ is our focus and our prize and nothing else. When, when our focus is take, taken off Christ and placed on worldly pursuits, we entangle ourselves in civilian pursuits. The battle is constant, and, it, and we cannot waver from it. We always fight the good fight. We do this on a daily basis. This means that we make every decision for the glory and honor of God, small or big, which sometimes involves difficult actions, right? There are times when you have to make a difficult decision to honor God. It could mean losing a job. It could mean ridicule from those who don't understand the gospel. It could mean following God into something that doesn't make any sense to the world. When did following God become about making sense? Consider, think about the, the examples we have in Scripture of when people did great things for God. Abraham, go to a land I will show you. What if God told you, just go somewhere, I'll show you eventually. Just go, trust me. I'm not going to tell you what your salary is going to be. I'm not going to tell you what, what your 401k will be. Just, just go. Could you do that? It doesn't make sense, does it? Moses, lead an entire nation out of slavery against an army. David, kill a giant with a sling and a stone. This stuff does not make sense. And this isn't to say that something, that is, God, uh, something is God's will just because it doesn't make sense. But we shouldn't write something off because it doesn't make sense to to us and we can't fathom it sometimes God calls us to do difficult things and we trust him and follow where he leads that is being a good soldier Paul says an athlete has to compete according to the rules and the hard-working farmer reaps the harvest we understand farmers in this community right so the hard-working farmer is the one that reaps the harvest God sets the rules and follow him requires following him requires hard work and endurance particularly in times of difficulty 
But he assures us in verse 7 that the Lord is going to give us understanding. We're not asked to understand because understanding comes from him. We're just asked to trust him, and he will give us the understanding. We're called to focus on and trust our enlister, namely Jesus Christ, even in the difficult times. So a good soldier suffers well and suffers for his enlister. The second thing you're going to see here, look at verses 8 through 10. Remember Jesus Christ. We're talking about remembrance this weekend. It's Memorial Day weekend. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with change as a criminal. But the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they may also obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. So the second thing we see here is that a good soldier remembers the goal. We have to realize that a good soldier remembers the goal. And the goal and and the prize in our lives is Jesus Christ. Romans 8.29 says that the purpose of our salvation is to be conformed to the image of Christ. You know, sometimes we, we give people the wrong idea and we say that heaven is the ultimate goal of becoming a Christian. That's a perk. That's icing on the cake. The ultimate goal is being conformed into Christ's image. That is our goal. And throughout the Christian life, we are being transformed into his, into his image. And if you're a believer, hopefully you can look back on your life and say, at this point I was here, God has brought me here. And he continues to make me more like him. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3.18 that we're being transformed from one degree of glory to another. I, re- I refer to that often as progressive sanctification. Christ is the goal, and a good soldier remembers that not only, uh, not only the goal, but he remembers how to get to that goal, how to become like Christ. Christ is the goal, period. And if we see Christ for who he is, we will be changed. He says in verse 8 here, to remember Jesus Christ. He doesn't say, remember what Jesus Christ has done, although that is absolutely crucial. But he says to remember Jesus Christ. Remember him, remember who he is. The Greek word for remember here is active, and it implies continuation. In other words, we're not only to remember Christ, but we're to continue and keep on remembering him in our daily lives. He has to be the forefront of everything we do. He shouldn't be number one on a priority list, but he should literally be our priority list. He should be the purpose and foundation of our work, school, family, relationships, and even our leisure activities. Christ has to be at the center, and a good soldier remembers this goal. If we do not remember Jesus Christ, we'll cave under pressure when trials come. Basing our lives on anything else, such as education, financial stability, government, retirement, anything else, you name it, it will fail us. And so Paul was suffering when he wrote this to Timothy, yet he was encouraged and strong in his faith because he remembered Jesus Christ. He says in verse 10 that he endures everything for the sake of the elect, that they may obtain the salvation in Jesus Christ. When we remember Christ, we can suffer well, and God uses our suffering to bring others to him. That's why our foundation has to be Christ and Christ alone. The reformers often spoke of solus Christus, or Christ alone. He has to be our foundation. Anything else will fail. He is the goal. I'm not a very good golfer, but if you ever ask me to play golf, I would love to play with you because I enjoy playing, and you might get a laugh out of it if you watch me play. I'm not as bad as Charles Barkley, but I, um, I'm almost there. But one thing I'm certain of is when I swing the club, if I don't keep my eye focused on the ball, if my head moves in any way, I'm not going to effectively strike the ball. I might, but I'll get lucky if I do. I'm, I'm more likely to effectively strike the ball when I keep my eye focused on the ball. That's the goal. And so many times in our lives, when we take our eyes off of Christ because of the turmoil around us, we can't effectively, we can't be good soldiers of the Lord. We have to stay focused on the goal. A good soldier remembers the goal. Let's finish up here and look in verses 11 through 13. Paul says, The saying is trustworthy, for if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. So the last thing we see here is that a good soldier remains faithful. A good soldier remains faithful to the cause and to the goal. 
So once our foundation is built upon Christ, which if you are a believer, if you are a Christian, your foundation is Christ. But we have to follow through and remain faithful. A good soldier remains faithful and does not waver when the test comes. Paul encourages us, he points out that death is not the end for those in Christ. He says, if we die with him, we will also live with him. And if we endure, we will also reign with him. Again, this doesn't make sense in the economy of the world. This is God's economy. Philippians 1.21 tells us that to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's not something you hear in the world. They say get rich, get as much as you can, live your life. Paul says to live is Christ and to die is gain. He says, I count all things lost for the sake of knowing Christ. That's backwards from what the world tells us. If we are faithful, we will ultimately persevere. But if we deny Christ, he will deny us according to verse 12. In verse 13 then, Paul says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. The faithfulness spoken of here he's referring to is a lack of saving faith, not a a weak or struggling faith. Unbelievers are going to ultimately deny Christ. And as faithful as Jesus is to save those who believe in him, he is equally faithful to judge those who do not believe in him. And to act in any other way would be inconsistent with his holy and unchangeable nature. That's why it's so crucial for us as the church to live as good soldiers of the Lord, allowing God to work in and through us to bring people to him, bring the lost to him. Our battle is not against the lost, but it is for Christ to make himself known to them through us. Yes, we're going to face difficulties. And if we're not facing difficulties, something is wrong. If we're not facing trials, there's, there's a problem. All believers are guaranteed to face trials. We live in a country where, thankfully, right now, we don't have to worry about necessarily losing our lives on a, uh, for knowing Christ. There are many places in the world where people do have to be concerned about that. Maybe one day we'll be there, but my hope and prayer is that if we ever do get there, that our faith would may, remain steadfast and strong, that we would not waver just because of a trial. Is it worth it, though? It's absolutely worth it because it's for a greater cause. It's for the cause of Christ. A good soldier remains faithful. Many of you know that I have a dog, and it's a very unhealthy relationship. I think I love her way too much. Her name's Gracie. She's a lab and basset hound mix. They're called bassadors. She looks like a small golden lab, but droopy eyes, short legs, and longer ears. And she's about 10 years old, and I've had her since she was two, and uh, she's my baby. It's a, uh, uh, like I said, a very unhealthy relationship. I give her people food. She sleeps in the bed with me. It's probably not a good thing. But anyway, she is my dog, and she is very loyal to me, very faithful to me. In fact, someone else could offer her the entire world, or all the treats in the world, and I don't think she would budge. I think she would come back to me. But um, she knows my voice. She comes to me when I call her. I hardly ever have to use a leash. She's very faithful to me. And every waking moment of her life is spent trying to please me. And when when I leave, she hates it. When I come home, she's always happy to see me. And uh, sometimes I think that God uses dogs to uh, show us how our hearts should be towards him. We have to be faithful to him and loyal to him and love him that much where every waking moment is designed and intended to please him. We have to be faithful to God no matter what the world offers us, because no matter how difficult things get, and no matter what the cost, being a good soldier of the Lord requires faithfulness. So we've seen what Paul has said to Timothy here about being a good soldier of the Lord, and the foundation upon doing that is remembering Jesus Christ remembering him as we're considering what it means to remember this weekend remember tomorrow we will be remembering those who have paid the ultimate sacrifice being a good soldier of the lord requires remembering jesus christ we've seen three imperatives here suffering for the glory of god remembering the goal in christ jesus and remaining faithful doing those things are necessary to be a good soldier and we have to ask ourselves if we fit this description of a good soldier If not, we have to ask the Lord to work in and through our lives and our hearts 
and making us more like him and making us good sufferers, people who remember him and want, run with steadfastness towards the prize that we have in him, and people who remain faithful to his cause. We're all familiar, most of us are familiar with the hymn, I'd rather have Jesus. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. And there's a line in there that says, I'd rather be faithful to his dear cause. No matter what the world offers me, no matter how difficult things get, I'm going to choose to honor Christ and be a faithful servant and a good soldier. When that's our heart's cry, then and only then will we be good soldiers of the Lord. He's given us the directions. He's given us his word. We know what to do. Now we just have to honor that. If we do that, we're good soldiers of the Lord. I hope that this morning you can say that you're a good soldier of the Lord. I hope that you can say that you honor him, that every decision you make is for him, that he is at the forefront and the center of everything that you do, that he is um, on your mind, he is on your heart constantly. Small or big decisions, that you honor him in that and that you are a good soldier of the Lord. If you're not, you can be. And maybe this morning you need to allow God to search your heart so that you can become a more effective soldier for his glory and his name's sake. If you don't know him this morning, you can. There's a way. It's not hopeless. You can know him. You can know Jesus Christ, God, the creator of the universe. You can know him personally. That's why he died, so that we can know him. We're not separated by a curtain anymore. We can come directly to him. So this morning, I hope that you know him and that you can say you're a good soldier in his name. Let's pray together. God, as we've seen here, what Paul has told us to be a good soldier, it will be difficult at times, and you have called us to suffer well, and you've called us to endure and to remain faithful no matter what the cost, no matter how difficult things get. God, this morning we want to honor you. We want to be good soldiers. I pray that that is every person's cry and prayer this morning, that they would be a good soldier for you. Not for our sake, but for your sake, so that you are known. God, we are fighting a daily battle. Some fight a more difficult battle than others, and there are some in this body of believers, God, that are facing very difficult situations. I pray that you would give them the strength that they need. You've given us everything we need for life and for godliness, and I pray that you would give each of us the strength we need to serve and honor you no matter how difficult the situation gets, that we would suffer well, that we would remain faithful to your cause. Whatever the need is this morning, God, let us serve you. Let us run to you. Let us repent if we need to repent. Let us be good soldiers. I pray that you would chisel away any part of us that does not need to be there and that you would conform us into your image and who you are. We're yours. We want to honor you. I pray that you would speak now, God, that you have... Uh, been speaking in this service and that those that have heard from you would respond accordingly. This time is yours and we respond now, God, and it's in your name. Amen. We're going to have a time of invitation. I'll be at the front if you need to talk or pray, whatever decision you need to make for the Lord.